that are going to be all coming on right now. So it looks like we should have most of the people on right now. Um, anyways, just wanted to welcome everybody from uh, across the world, actually. We've had some in Austria to Norway to, um, to Canada. So we wanna welcome everybody. We're really excited to have um, a, another great one, a shooting a score with Tara Connolly. And I'm gonna pass it on to Tara and Kristen right now. So the show is all yours. Thanks, Dave. We're really excited to have Tara Connolly here talking about shooting mechanics and scoring. She's currently the assistant coach at RPI. Uh, she's been there since 2017. A native of Connecticut who graduated from Bowdoin College after playing goalie in both hockey and lacrosse. Uh, she's worked at our girls national player development camps for the last six years in a variety of roles from intern coach to goalie coach to skills coach. Um, she also was an assistant coach at Wesleyan for a long period of time prior to going uh, up to RPI. So we're really excited to have her here. She provides a really great perspective on both sides of the scoring side and the goaltending side. So without further ado, I'm going to kick it over to Tara. Thanks, Kristen. Thanks everyone at USA Hockey for, uh, for having me. I'm excited to be here. Um, you know, obviously, as Kristen said, I was a goalie, so it's a, an interesting perspective not having scored goals in actual games, but a lot of goalie world goals. So I like to think I've learned something. Um, but no, I think it's, it's just a conversation about, um, you know, how to generate more goals, especially off of pure shooting. And, um, you know, I always go back to, if I can get it going here, like your why, you know, why is it important to do this right now? And um, for me, it's because youth hockey is a really critical time in skill development. So as coaches, for all the youth hockey coaches who are watching, it's a really neat opportunity to help develop um, at a really critical stage and instill really good techniques and habits into your players that will carry them through to when they get to college and higher levels. Um, by the time we, we get them as college coaches, um, their habits are really, really ingrained in them. It's really hard to break, um, especially things like skating and, and balance and, and athleticism and things that are, are really part of who you are. So, um, so that's why I'm excited to talk about it with, with coaches who have a real opportunity to, to kind of roll their sleeves up and, and help players out at the younger level. Um, which will carry them through. And then for younger players who are watching, which I was excited to hear, there's some, some youth players out there tuning in. I think this is really critical for you guys because, as I said, this is the opportunity for you guys to, to put good habits into your game and to do things the right way so that as you get older um, and the game gets faster and more physical, you'll have the tools to be able to not only keep up but, but really succeed. Um, and also, I know right now, it's, it's the coronavirus, it's a real bummer. I got the notification on my phone that my flights were supposed to be coming out for, uh, for nationals. I know we're really bummed about that, but, you know, I'm a big believer and you have to take what the situation gives you and make the best of it in life. And I think this is a really great opportunity um, heading into the off season a little bit early to utilize what you do have, which is you have a driveway, you should have your stick and you can grab some pucks and balls and some tapes, um, whatever you can grab to mimic pucks and, and objects and, and make the best out of the situation to improve your mechanics, to improve your shot, and to do what you can do without necessarily having access to ice and, and all the other the things that we can have. So that's kind of my goal for this presentation is to, to start simple, to zoom in really on the basics of technique, of stick fit, um, things that we might always might take for granted a little bit because, um, you know, one of my, my big beliefs is that the devil's in the details. So the more specific you can get and the better you can do those things, the better it's going to help you in the future. Um, and then for coaches and even players, uh, providing a couple simple drills, progressions, ideas for how you can implement these types of skills into your practices, whether you have full ice, whether you don't have full ice, um, you know, whether you have a, a chunk of time to work on some skills and some shooting um, and some things you can look for with that. And then finally, to just give you guys also some, some thoughts um, and some concepts and how to beat goalies. I mean, that's, like I said, that's kind of my unique perspective on, uh, on shooting and on scoring is that I've been on the receiving end of a lot of goals between hockey and lacrosse. And, um, you know, there's a lot of common themes and commonalities that, that go across the spectrum in terms of what it takes to, to put a puck in the back of the net. And, um, you know, defense wins championships for sure, but you need to be able to score. And whether that's um, from good shooting, from hard net front play, from screens and traffic, we'll kind of talk through some of those concepts and then talk about some, some small games that, you know, can help emphasize those concepts and how you can tweak maybe your small games that you like to play to, um, to add different emphasis and really force more creativity um, among your players. 
Um, so I was kind of thinking about, uh, I, love, I love to read a lot of the, you know, psychology, social psychology books. So Angela Duckworth has a really good book uh, called Grit. And she talks about how you come up with kind of an equation. So I figured if I was going to have like a bit of a thesis for this presentation, that I would have to have kind of an equation. So this is the equation that I, I came up with. And I'm not a mathematic uh, person. I'm a history person. <laughs> so those of you who are like, this is not an equation. There's no equal sign. I agree. Uh, but sound mechanics plus quick release plus proper placement is going to give you your results, which is a goal, right? A lot of times, and maybe a little bit of puck luck in between. Um, but that's essentially the piece. So right now we're gonna start by focusing in a bit on those sound mechanics, which is really your habits. Like it's, it's what you're instilling in terms of proper technique. And not everybody's shot looks the same. You know, Ovechkin looks different from Crosby. Everybody has a little bit of a different release point or they like their hands and their stick in a different spacing. Um, you know, some people take more types of shots like a slap shot or a one-timer than others who are more wrist shot based. Um, so again, it's not all one size cookie cutter fits all model, um, but your habits, what you're doing every day, doing it properly with attention to detail is what's going to create, um, you know, those types of good habits. And that's really important at a young level. And then repetition. So how do you create, build those good habits? How do you get quick release shots off? Repetition. Um, I have a lot of players, just, you know, college level, doesn't matter. They always say, well, I, I need more confidence in my shot. I need more confidence. And my answer to them is always that where does confidence come from? It comes from repetition. It comes from doing things over and over again so that by the time you get in a scoring situation in a game, uh, by the time you're, you're even in practice, you're not thinking about it. You know I've already taken, you know, a thousand shots that week off the ice to practice my shot. I get that puck on my stick, my head's up, and I'm able to now <clears throat> take in what's happening around me. I don't have to think about where the puck is on my blade, about my follow-through, about my weight transfer, all those little details that we're going to talk about. When you repeat them over and over again properly, you're not going to have to think about that. It's going to come more naturally. And then the last part there is the recognition. And that's, you know, as we're kind of moving through, it really ascends in terms of skill level and IQ. So again, once you have your proper habits and you've repeated them a ton of times, it's going to allow you to play the game with your head up. It's going to allow you to play, you know, cat and mouse with goalies, with defensemen. It's going to allow you to see what the game's giving you so you can take it, where you can attack, um, the type of shot you're going to want to use or what, what's going to be open. Um, so that's kind of my equation. And uh, there's two equations, actually. <laughs> so like I said, not a math person, but hoping that kind of clicks with a few of you right now as you're kind of thinking about, you know, especially purely shooting to score, um, what, that, what that means. So again, a quick overview of the presentation that, that I wanted to give you guys. We're going to start with really basic where to shoot and talk about, you know, vulnerable spots on goaltenders, um, what the puck sees. I think that's really valid to think about because we all see – from top down, but the puck is seen from the ice up. Um, so putting ourselves kind of in those, in the shoes of the puck, if you will, um, and then thinking about where there's going to be some openings. Um, how to shoot, and we'll talk from basic, you know, especially for youth players and not just youth players, we have college players who have this issue. <laughs> the height and flex, some basic things about that. And then, um, and then some concepts. We'll watch some videos and then have a little more fun with, uh, with the five on five aspect of the game, obviously. One of the most, couple of the most crucial areas to score in hockey are on face-offs in the offensive zone, as well as power plays. When you can have, you know, set plays, possession time. Um, but I'm, I'm going to focus more so on five on five. And again, those are a couple, couple quick, um, you know, quotes that I tend to live by. The devil's in the details. So again, like I said, this is a great opportunity to get in your basement. Sorry, parents, if you don't want holes in your walls um, or dents in your garage door, but this is really the time to do it if you don't have a net. It doesn't matter if you don't have a ton of stuff. Pick a spot on the wall, put a little tape up there, and try to hit that mark over and over again with your snapshot, with your wrist shot, with your slap shot, and you'll get better if you do things the right way. Um, and that was kind of the last quote. I think Courtney Kennedy used it at a national camp a couple of years ago, and it always stuck with me. It's not just knowing what to do. It's doing what you know. Um, you don't have to have been a coach for 20 years to have good advice for a player on, on what they can do. Even if, like I said, if you're picking 25 shots to each corner, with your wrist shot, if you're doing that the right way, um, sometimes there's not necessarily some magical, amazing next thing that you can do. You can keep folks in doing that a little bit better. So something to think about. Um, so a little bit of, of where to shoot. Um, and again, I think that first point is really critical. You gotta think about um, shooting from the puck angle. Puck angle trajectory is going up. So a lot of times the holes, um, Kristen, can you guys see this mouse? You can see the mouse? Yes. Yep. Okay, awesome. Um, as I'm, I don't wanna point to nothing. Um, so as <laughs> As you guys can see, the puck angle is coming up, and I think that's an area where you see a lot of, of uh, shoot, young shooters especially getting really tantalized by 
by trying to pick corners and go to top shelf, which, which is great, but you also have to know yourself as a shooter. Um, and if you're not a sharpshooter and you're just trying to get pucks off quickly, one of the toughest things for goalies to stop is anything between six and 12 inches off the ice, uh, because this is where they have the least amount of protection, especially when they drop down into their butterfly. Um, so something to think about as well. Again, if we're trying to shoot to create rebounds because we're not in an optimal area to have time to really pick a spot or have our head up, we're just trying to get shots off quick. Um, that's one of the best places to look on goalies. It's the toughest to control for rebounds. And then, of course, when they're down their butterfly, we're going to see another one where, you know, you can find those spots over their ears, over their heads. Like we said here, and this is a young goalie, so they haven't quite dropped their hands down well enough in their butterfly. Um, but as you can see, big goalies especially, um, you know, they tend to struggle with lower shots as they're trying to get down. Smaller goalies, and they're dropping, they tend to expose a lot of net up high right? Um, so little things to think about. And I think as you're watching goalies and warmups, if you're, you know, if you're playing a team and, um, you know, especially youth hockey, it's like you're all warming up at the same time. It's like, take a look across the ice and see, you know, what, what are some of the shots they struggle with? What are some of the things they, they look to find difficult? Um, if you've played a goalie for the same, the same time, a couple of times, um, you know, start to pick up on some of those tendencies. I know when I was a goalie in the cross, like my teammate and I, who was an attacker, we would constantly competing against each other every practice. And I knew where she was starting to go because I would pay attention to those little details. So I think shooters can utilize their goalies a lot uh, by asking them in practice, like, hey, what, what type of shot is really hard for you? Um, what do you, what do you know, with goalies, you should be asking your players, what are you seeing when you shoot on me? Like what's open to help pick their heads up? And then as well, I mean, um, like Mark Cavosi tells a story, our, our goalie, Lavisa Slander, um, was an All-American and a, a Patty Kazmaier top final, top 10 finalist. And one of the things she did really well was read shooters and she would tell our players, like, I see where your eyes are looking. I can tell where you're going to shoot right now. And that feedback is so critically important for shooters. And I think you need to keep engaging with your goalies in order to steer that. Um, so again, I Tara, think the, the, Tara on yeah. that quick question. So with those yep. images that you showed, is that something you would recommend that youth coaches show their, their players so that they get at that perspective and how would you facilitate that communication with them? Yeah, totally. I think you can do it anytime you're on the ice. So to Kirsten's point, it's like you want to think about it from from the goalie's perspective. So you want to think about angles, which is, I mean, I even do this with our goaltenders when we um, work with youth goalies in the summer too. put a puck on the ice. I have uh, one goalie stay in the net and I have another goalie get on the ice, lay on their stomach flat underneath right behind the puck and look straight up and talk about where they, where do you see holes, you know, and then we move them a little bit so they can see it. Because for goalies, you always want to have the center of your body on the puck in order to stay square in that angle. Um, and it helps show them kind of what, what's exposed. So right now we can even see, this is great for, for this goalie. Um, you, you can tell from the puck angle here that her gloves are too high in that stance. Um, we were using this slide to talk also about goalie stick height and paddle height and hand height. So it was perfect. But um, yeah, hundred percent. I think coaches should be talking through like what angles mean for goalies, what the puck sees, um, you know, so that as they're taking those shots, they're, they're hopefully have their head up and are looking for specific areas um, when they're shooting and not just kind of throw a puck on that. Great. Thank you. Yeah, of course. Um, so again, I think it, it starts with the, the simplicity piece. And, and I know a lot of parents and youth coaches aren't going to want to really hear this, but um, we have a, we had a player on our team who had her, um, her father would kind of cut his stick down and then give it to her as a kid. And you can tell by the way she would stick handle because she had to have the puck so far behind her because I'm sure it was too long and then also too stiff. Um, so it is important as much as I know sticks are expensive and things like that and it can be easier to just cut your stick down and hand it to them. There's a reason there are junior sticks and intermediate sticks for players. Um, that's really important. So first and foremost, the stick height. And this is again, I bring this up because we've actually gone through this with our with our college players um, where we've seen them, you know, with sticks up to here on the ice and over their nose. Yes, certain players want a little bit more length, maybe defensively at times. But I think at the end of the day, it's most important that you are effective when you have a puck on your stick. Um, so make sure that when you're on the ice, that, that stick should really be about your chin height, um, you know, what's comfortable there. So making sure when they're off the ice, you, you have it down to their chin or it should be up to their nose off the ice, on the ice about the chin height. Um, and then if you have an off ice stick, if you have the luxury of being able to shoot in your garage with an off ice stick that's separate, you almost want to account for the fact that you're a little bit shorter off the ice than you are in your skate. Um, so you can, you can cut that even a little bit lower, but just know the more you cut, right, you're going to drop that flex. And the flex, for, for those who don't know, it has to, be, it has to do with the um, amount of pounds of force that it takes to flex the stick one inch. So the lower the flex, obviously, the easier it is to, the whippier the stick, the easier it is to, um, 
to in fact uh, flex the stick, which is important for younger players because the stuff that we talk about with release and things like that, if the stick, if the stick is too stiff, a lot of times they end up pushing it or they're taking that shot from too far away from their feet. And you should be able to effectively use your body weight um, in your shot to be able to flex the, the shaft and get really good power on your shot. Um, so I think especially for girls, I've seen that be a really big issue where they're shooting from out front. And we'll kind of talk about that um, in a second. Tara, with the stick flex as a college coach, uh, what, like, could you say on average, what stick flex a lot of your players are using at the college level? I would say our players, depending on height and body weight, because the, the kind of general rule of thumb for, um, for flex is that it's about half your body weight. Um, most of our players are within the 67 to 75, 70, I think 75 is the next jump range. Um, I am surprised generally if there's girls in the 80 range um, for flex. I think even if you look like Ovechkin's using something in the 67 to 77 range, um, so generally speaking, um, they're on the lower end of the flex, flex patterns in the senior six. Um, some even are using intermediate depending on height. That's where it gets really tricky, especially for girls if we tend to be on the shorter side. And we've run into that issue before. I'm waiting for Bauer to, to make a women's stick that, um, that might be able to mitigate some of that, where you can have a bit of a shorter stick without having to drop all the way into like a 55 flex. Um, but Typically, we're there within that 67 to 77 range. So I would look at the junior six, look at the intermediate six, think about your kid's kind of body weight and where that fits in. And that's where a lot of those pro shops can hopefully give you some, some good thoughts as well. And you don't have to spend $300 on a stick to find one that can at least give you some, you know, like the kick point and all these other things with, with young players is not as important as just having the proper height and flex fit, I believe. Yeah, we found a lot of success in online hockey shops, given that a lot of the local in-person shops don't necessarily have the same amount of um, inventory, especially with those lower flex sticks. I was always surprised to see our national team players using stick flexes between 55 and 65 flex. I think Brianna Decker uses a 65 flex stick. Yeah. Um, and so just something to keep in mind when we're talking about youth players who are probably not as strong um, or as proficient in their use of that. No, absolutely. Yeah, and I think even higher level players will use lower flex um, because they do want that quick snappy release. I mean, Decker wants to shoot in stride all the time. And, um, you know, sometimes there are players who want a stiffer flex because they want to handle pucks. The lower you get in the, in the flex, the whippier the stick. So in terms of receiving passes and things like that, it can, there is a bit of a trade off as there always is. But again, I think that's more important and more of a conversation when you're at a higher level and can kind of understand the differences in that. Um, for sure. Like I said, I'll take a player who has a really good case for why they want a longer stick, as long as they're not giving me a reason to say, well, you can't get that shot off because, <laughs> because you're losing it off your blade all the time because your stick is too long. So, yeah. right? like, don't, don't give me a reason. But um, so some of the just the technique, technique issues that we see, especially at the college level, um, that, that kind of start at the younger level is, uh, is a lack of weight transfer in their shot. So your legs and your core are the strongest parts of your body especially for girls, you guys are, are developmentally different than guys and upper body wise, we're generally not as strong. So trying to rely just on our arms and on pushing a shot isn't going to be nearly as strong and as accurate as snapping through it. Um, so I like this uh, video of Bertuzzi, Tyler Bertuzzi from the Detroit Red Wings from the NHL skills competition this year, because they'll start the competition and I'll, I'll talk through it first and then let it play so it doesn't lag. He starts the, uh, starts the competition kind of shooting off his back foot a little bit, so that left foot right here. And then as he's, you know, he's still taking pretty good shots, obviously, but as he gets more, more intense in the competition and is really focused on, on the accuracy piece, he starts pushing hard off his back foot and shooting with really good technique, and you'll see that weight transfer there. So I'll let this one play. So you can see how he's not really transitioning. He's kind of ending with his weight back a little bit, a little bit more balanced. And now he's starting to get into it, and you see that exaggerated weight transfer where he pushes off that back foot follows all the way through he's got good torque in his upper body and then he finishes with that blade closed so even the pros sometimes can get caught being a little bit lazy and trying to push a puck um, but I thought that was a really good example some basement shooting um, the other thing that we tend to see a lot is um, as you can see there my my top hand is really glued kind of to the hip um, which we see a lot, I think, in girls hockey as well, where that's, that top hand never really comes off the hip. There's not a separation of the hands from the body, and that's so much of hockey. You have to be able to have that mobility, and it leads to that weight being stuck back a lot of times because I can't follow through and push because I'm kind of jammed up. 
Um, this one actually was difficult to try to film and think about <laughs> because it's not a, it's not super natural. So having our hands off our hips to shoot is, um, you know, is, is critical in those moments. One thing I had another video that might not have loaded, but um, there was another um, a grip that I watched that I've seen from a couple of girls, uh, even at the college level, where they go to grip with that top hand. And instead of kind of having that, this is my stick here, kind of a handshake grip where it's right in that V between my thumb and my index finger, a lot of them torque. So they're, they're cranking that wrist over and you can see essentially inside their glove down to, um, down to the top of their, or um, the back of their hand. So I've seen that a little bit too in shooting, which also, again, makes it really challenging to snap and roll your wrists over so that those thumbs are facing the net when you finish your shot. So something to just be wary of, I think for, for youth coaches as well, is that follow through is so important. And if your wrist is really cranked over the top of your stick, it's not a, it's not a natural motion. You gotta make sure that stick is sitting kind of right in a V on the top of in your top hand. Um, just another one as well, like we talked about, you can see this puck is too far away, too far away from my body. So I'm going to be pushing it with my arms, not utilizing my legs, and then opening up my stick blade on that follow through. So it's a little bit awkward, as you can see, see how far that puck is from my body. It's tougher to, to engage with it. I got to really reach into it and then following through with that blade open, which hurts our accuracy and our power. So now, obviously, we kind of talked about like what not to do, but I'm a firm believer in seeing is better than showing. And um, so this is Mark Cavosi, who's our other assistant coach. He was a, a Hobie Baker finalist when he played at RPI. Great shooter himself. But you'll see just in his video here, he's got his hands off his body. Um, his top hand is off that hip like we talked about. He's got good weight transfer, push off that back foot. He digs in with his inside edge. His blade is closed. There's a good snap. And both his thumbs are facing towards that at the end of that shot. He's got his head up as well. I think that's an underrated skill in shooting. Um, a lot of times even, you know, our players will see him go back to the shooting range and they're busy looking at the puck the whole time until they're released. If you guys want to get better at your accuracy and your follow through and all these other things, you got to make sure you're taking that shot with your head up the whole time. A couple simple drills um, that I wanted to give you guys, and we'll, we'll do a couple off the ice too. We can talk through that, obviously, because we don't have as much ice access right now. Uh, but some simple drills, you just saw that one from Mark. Here's another where you're just pulling that puck. You can put an object out. You can put a little X on the ice. So you're just pulling that puck and then transitioning your weight into it for a quick shot. So that's that pull shot where maybe you're attacking a defenseman. You pull that puck in tighter to your feet to create a quick angle and take a shot. So we're not only moving the angle of the puck, as we'll see, but we're also creating a lane for ourselves and then loading into our, into our feet so we have that triple threat stance for a quick shot. Similarly, this is a, the inverse of that, it's a, the push shot. So it's a little bit awkward because we're standing still, but you gotta have that envision why and when you might use this. Um, a lot of times when you're cutting into the middle of the ice, you're protecting, say you're on your off hand. Um, this is the opportunity to push that puck, get your body around it, and then make sure you're still transferring your weight into that shot towards net. Um, one of the things we see a lot of times when players cut in the middle of the ice is they take that shot and they're falling away from it, um, which again, is kind of what we were talking about with that lack of weight transfer. And then that stick blade being open, it's really hard to control and you're going to sky that shot a lot of times. So here, just again, is a push shot we were talking about. So it's push that puck and then transition your weight into it with your body so that you're utilizing your legs and your core. Tara, I noticed that Mark in both of those videos keeps the puck on his forehand, uh, something we sometimes call underhandling. Is that something you talk about at the college level and what type of habit is that and is it important? Yeah, 100%. I think that's the, the thing I keep saying the most and we'll watch a whole series of shots. My whole um, my whole thing with shooting is that quicker is always better. And how do you get quicker? You don't stick handle it. Um, so anytime you're doing shooting drills, it really behooves you as a coach to emphasize to your players that there shouldn't be any stick handling um, after they catch a shot and before they release it, as, as little as possible. Sometimes if you have a puck in your backhand, you might need to get it to your forehand and then get a quick release off. Um, but there's a lot of ways you can challenge your players to get quicker releases, and that's definitely one of them. But the game moves too fast. You have to be able to move pucks, um, whether that's a pass, a chip, um, whether that's protect yourself on your forehand. And, um, you know, I, I'm a firm believer in, um, in possessing pucks as much as possible, and, and part of that is just using your forehand. It's not stick handling. It's having it in a place where you can pass, shoot, or, uh, or chip as much as possible. Great. Thank you. So just to show you guys again for goalies, like that's the angle change we're, we're seeking. Um, a lot of times we'll have players who say this is their original shot angle. 
they'll skate it at the goalie and then take that shot right on the original angle. So for a goaltender, it's easy because they're already set to that shot. Whereas if you do that little motion, you have a push motion, you shoot, or say you're starting from this angle, you pull it and you shoot. Now that goaltender has to adjust to that new angle. Like we talked about, the center of their body has to try to stay on that puck. Um, so if a goalie is, is on it and they can adjust, then maybe you can shoot back against the grain and make it really hard on them. If they're slow to adjust on that little quick push, push pull movement, um, you might open up uh, an opportunity as you push it, say this way to that far side. Um, so that's where, again, like we talked about that head up and, and engagement with the goaltender and their movement is going to be really critically important. So not only goaltenders, but also defensemen, it creates shooting lanes for you all over the ice. Um, so just again, like to get back to what we were talking about and thinking about what the puck sees, um, a lot of times our sticks are about four or five feet. They're going to be longer and see something different than what our eyes see. So I might be here physically with my body, but I've pushed that puck out this way and that puck's going to see a lot more net than my eyes do. So we have to trust and take those shots a lot of times, even if we're not 100% certain that we're seeing net, uh, because it is there. It is going to take goaltenders time to adjust and, and get to the puck. So kind of a next level skill now, and again, I know a lot of these are block drills and, and they're not massively fancy, but um, I am a firm believer and you have to be able to do the basics in order to continue to transition it. So now just again, like Kristen was saying, a really simple catch and release um, when you have a player on the ice where you can just put it right on their forehand. <laughs> We're not all pros, it happens. Um, we can put it right on their forehand, catch, release, and that's where you can really focus on those details of head up, follow through, transition your weight, push, so they can see that puck to their tape and then get their head up right away. Just a really simple drill there, and then you can start to progress that into making them adjust their feet. Um, and this is like Kristen always is a big firm believer, I know, in different variables and elevating and progressing drills. Um, so now we can start to think about how can we give players um, maybe bad passes and start to mimic some game situations. So now we're going to put this puck out in front of Mark. He's going to have to move his feet around it, adjust, catch, and release shots. So now we're adding another element there where it's a little bit more difficult. We don't have time to stick handle it, right? We got to get our feet around it, load our feet, get our weight transfer into our shot, and then shoot. Maybe handle a bad pass like that. So again, even if players, there's some open ice, so you have an opportunity to jump out there, you can have somebody jump out with you and give you some, some good passes, but also some bad passes um, and learn how to handle it. Same idea here. Here's a, a pass coming in front of you. Oops, sorry. Here's a pass coming in front of you. Uh, maybe it's a hard pass. You don't have quite time to get your body around it. So it's a quick stop and shot. So you're stopping it on that backhand and just trying to get it off as quick as possible. Again, he's still utilizing that weight transfer, getting his body around it, getting it to his forehand, like Kristen said, as quickly as possible, getting his head up and then following through. So another look at that. So now maybe we're gauging, and this is where that next level of um, recognition comes in. Now maybe we're seeing a rebound come out or a puck come trickling slower. I know I have time to get my feet around it. I don't have to stop it. I need to just get around it and one touch it as quick as possible. So we can vary the speed on that, right? A little bit slower pass, get your feet around it, one touch. Yeah, Tara, this is a great example of, I mean, especially we talk about block drills and how do kids learn and making it game-like, but you do have variables in here. If, if the player isn't aware of where that puck's coming, at what speed it's coming, you have that repetition without repetitiveness within this drill, though you don't have a defender. So it's at that beginning of that progression into the more game-like settings. But especially if they don't have the skill set prior or you know you don't have enough people especially right now in quarantine to uh, be with more than one or two people uh, this is a great um, setting that does have some variable to it totally yeah and right now it's like use what you have if you have a tennis ball great you can roll that easily on any surface and work to get around it um, if you have a street hockey ball that's great obviously it's not the same weight as a puck but you're still mimicking similar reactions and um, work with whatever you have in the house, honestly. And um, that's, I'm a big believer in that too. We do that a lot in our drills and in our skill drills. We provide a lot of coach resistance where we'll step in as defensemen. Um, so that's something you can do as well as you can maybe step in and, um, you know, they have to read either they have the shot lane or maybe you're there and they have to step into it, protect and change that angle for a quick shot. So there's a lot of ways that you can progress a lot of these drills um, to, to utilize more read and react style um, and less kind of robotic, shooting because you don't want to become robots as shooters I'm a big believer I'm a big believer in that as well um, so any way we can keep progressing drills so that there's more read react game like situations um, it'll it'll allow the players to, to not only utilize the skill and focus on the skill but then start to apply it to which situation should I be should I be um, using this in 
again, sorry for the fact that I have to be the dummy in this, but quarantine. Um, so a couple, couple off ice shooting drills. Um, so we talked about that weight transfer being really important. Uh, but there are ways to manipulate your shooting off ice to actually practice in a major core. So here I have um, my front foot is actually down. So it's almost mimicking that I've pushed off my back foot, except I'm keeping it in the air. So if you have a buddy with you, they can hold your foot too for stability. But here we're going to work on really getting your body weight on that stick, getting flex into it and engaging the flex on the stick, using that down pressure and then snapping through. And because you don't have that transfer off your back foot, you're going to have to really engage your core to get that follow through. Um, so it looks a little bit interesting because I know we don't preach one foot shooting, but it's an opportunity to engage your core and work on that snap following through with your wrist um, and develop some of that strength that you might not, um, you might not otherwise utilize with two feet. Similar idea here. So typically again with younger shooters, we don't necessarily want to work on shooting off the off foot. However, you also want to shoot in stride. So how can we mimic that off the ice? Um, we can work on jumping into that shot, onto that front foot, engaging again the flex in the stick, and snapping through with the wrist. Um, so that's kind of my, my variety here, is jumping onto that front foot, engaging the flex, and then snapping through on the follow-through. Again, this is an old washed-up goalie, so apologies for that. <laughs> Once we get back on the ice, <laughs> um, was there a question? Or, or Give yourself a little more credit, I would say. <laughs> <laughs> no, it is amazing though. I will say once I started, um, once I got out of college, I started playing full time as a player, like any open ice or, or anything, but um, repetition does wonders. I was shooting on goalies all day long doing skill sessions and my shot improved so much because I was actually focusing on the details because I was coaching them. So I had to really make sure I was um, properly demonstrating them. So it is amazing. Like get on the ice if you can get, get, in, um, get in the basement or get outside on your driveway and get some shooting in the right way. Um, so again, this is a simple drill to, again, progress that now that we've kind of done some catch and release shooting, some attack and stationary shooting, we can get it moving because ultimately the goal of shooting is to, to get shots off quickly with power with your feet moving. Um, so this is a simple way any player, again, you can challenge yourself by attacking, changing the angle and then getting that shot off quick and making sure you're doing it with proper habits. So you're attacking, pushing or pulling around that object and following through at the net. Um, and you can vary it in a lot of different ways. You can cut to the middle, you can pull, you can drive low to a low angle. We like to use that on our goalies a lot as well, especially as warm-up shots um, to force them to have to adjust to it. But you can shoot that. You can take those shots from all different areas of the ice, and it's really simple. You're attacking, you're pushing, you're pulling to protect, and then you're trying to get that shot off as quickly as possible. Um, just some team drills here that we can do. We utilize um, all these types of things as well with our players when we do skills. So you can have this going off of both dots if you don't only have half ice. We can have that X1 open up, skate to the red line, open up, get a pass from the coach, attack in. So we're mimicking essentially a rush shot here. And then kind of like you just saw Mark doing, you're attacking that, um, attacking that cone or tire or water bottle, whatever you have and then trying to get that shot off as quickly as possible. Again, focusing on those details. Do you have good weight transfer? Are you following through to the net, finishing at the net for a rebound? Um, are you protecting that puck to get that shot off? So again, this is where, like Kristen said, you can start to add some different variables. So I can maybe have a coach standing there being kind of a, a light defensive pressure so that they have to protect that puck around the stick and then get it off. Um, we also like to progress this as well. So again, you can kind of run that off of both sides. Here we do the same thing. We have a, a, an actual player who's kind of a mock defender right at the top of the circle there. So they give some kind of easy pressure without trying to strip the player of the puck. So after that player X shoots the puck, she finishes the net, right? Good habits that you can always emphasize in warm-up drills, anything um, is, a, is a really good place to want to talk about scoring. There's always an opportunity every time there's a puck shot. Um, so that player finishes the net. We put a pile of pucks in the corner and then that X player will release to the corner, pick up a puck, Oh, we'll slide a little bit uh, tighter towards the hash marks there into the spot, get a pass, and then a quick catch and release. So you're stimulating an offensive zone uh, movement there as well. So you're getting two different types of shooting. And that's where, like, to Kristen's point, you know, as coaches, we'll probably add a little bit of extra pressure there um, on that retrieval. So maybe I'll go pressure above on that X and see if she'll cut back, protect, and then make that pass. You know, or maybe I'll give a little pressure to that O to make sure she's ready in the spot and has her stick ready to get that shot off as quickly as possible. So that's how you can kind of continue to vary it a little bit, um, as well as to think about what are some different looks. Maybe you add two players from uh, X1 as well as X2, and then X2 can either drive middle lane as if she's a, a second entry option, or she can drive weak side and try to be a rebounder as well.
Tracy, did you have a, was there a question? Nope, I, I, you know, you've really talked a lot about how adding that easy pressure changes the dynamics for the, the shooter. And really that makes it more transferable for that player into a game like setting. Um, do you want to talk a little bit about how important it is for them to read a stick or a defender in that setting? Totally. Yeah. I was actually going to say that. I'm glad you reminded me. Thank you. Um, I was going to say a lot of times too, you can instruct like these, these kind of dummy defenders here, your O's, you can tell them maybe have your stick to the outside so that they have their head up, that shooter realizes it and then cuts to the middle. So you're not telling them exactly what's going to happen, but you're telling them what to look for, which can kind of create that habit. It is really important um, because you want to try to take what the game gives you. You're always trying to attack inside the dots, inside the dots as an offensive player. Um, and you can run these off the half ball too, say. So if you're driving up, you can have a player defensively put their stick one way or the other so that, uh, you know, somebody who's attacking from the goal line might be able to read. I can cut below it or I can cut above it, depending on what's being given. Because um, good defensive players are always going to try to utilize their stick to influence your space. But as an offensive player, you've got to be able to read that, read the area to attack, keep your feet moving, protect, and then get that shot off as you're going. So this is just kind of the last phase of that. Um, but shooting at the end of the day, you have to create that space to get that shot off too. Um, so that's where your, your teammates can help you by being really difficult and either being really obvious in a drill like this um, so that you can read that, protect, and go, or by being really difficult. Maybe you take that stick away on this side, and then you try to trip them when they do cut to the middle. So you can play a little bit of, like I said, kind of cat and mouse where, um, you know, you can make it tough on your teammates or, um, or on your players to really – so keep them accountable. I mean, I like to do that in practices as well, where it's like, if, if it's easy for me to strip you right now, it's going to be easy for a, a defenseman on, you know, Colgate to be able to take a puck from you. Um, and then this kind of, my, that's my thing at the bottom it is a, I am a firm believer too that simple drills will allow players to focus on the why and the how rather than getting too wrapped up in the what and the where. It is really important. You know, there are markings on the ice for a reason, <laughs> um, but at the same point, I think if they're so bogged down in five different um, variations in a drill and, um, you know, in high level concepts like timing, which are really important to cover. Um, but if you're really focusing on a specific skill and some recognition there, I think you just have to be really smart with um, how you're packaging that to them and, and how you're focusing on it so that you're not taking away from the skill you really want to work on. Um, all right. So let's talk about some, some scoring concepts, my personal favorite. Um, so this is my this is my shooting motto that the quicker is always better. Um, you know I think anytime you can get a quick shot off, you have a way better percentage chance of beating goaltenders. And if not beating a goaltender, goaltender, then generating rebounds that your team will be able to take advantage of because goalies won't be able to get their feet set. A lot of times defensive coverage won't have time to recover um, or shift after a breakdown. So anytime you can get a quick one touch shot off or catch and release shot off, um, you're gonna you're gonna create a ton of scoring chances for yourself or your teammates. So we'll watch a Good amount of video here. So you see the uh, the white team here. They make a pass across that that royal road, and that player just catches and releases it right in. Here he gets that quick two touch shot that we showed, where he receives it on his backhand, one shot off, off a face off here on a set play, quick one timer, feet ready, quick follow through on a one timer pass out, another pass out here on a strong side one timer, where she gets her body around it, shot. And then another pass out low to high and a player coming through the slot off the rush. Give and go off the goal line, quick one touch shot. Another off the rush, Royal Road pass, quick one touch shot, strong side one timer. So it doesn't always have to be the prettiest shot, but it needs to be on and off your stick, especially in the scoring area. You see all these, all these shots and goals are coming from inside that house, right? If I drew the line up from the dots to the top of the circle, the cross and back to the post, that house that we always talk about. Um, we want to get there and we don't have time to take uh, a lot of stick handles or, or looks or second guesses. People know where they have to get that shot off from. And then I think the placement there was really important from a lot of these players as well. But getting it off is, is the most important uh, is the most important piece. So quicker is always better. And that's the goal. That's why we need sound mechanics and we need to be able to trust our shot to get it on net and at least give ourselves a, a quick chance there. Um, so the next one, so I broke this into two parts. So we talk about moving goaltenders laterally, and you'll see a lot of clips of uh, crossing the midline here, the Royal Road, as, as USA Hockey likes to call it, where your shooting percentages increase a ton. Um, I believe, what is it, 60 to 70 percent, Tristan, if you cross the uh, Royal mm -hmm. Road? Yep. Perfect. Um, and that reason is because of exactly what we were talking about before. When you see that puck angle change, you see that goalie have to keep up with it, and now they've got to reset and try to make a good 
uh, composed save after having relocated. So um, you'll see here this player on a two on two, they run a fake cross and drop, defenseman goes with them, and then he attacks and that goalie has to follow him all the way across. Here off a of face off, we have our player attack, attack, and it opens up that short side because that goalie pulls off her angle a little bit early. Here's a small angle change here, that little pull move we were talking about in our shooting before. Same thing here, a little pull and a quick shot. That goalie's moving laterally, doesn't get her feet set in time. Here again, you see this player comes all the way across and then gets a quick shot off before that goalie is able to slide with her. So carrying that puck across and then getting a quick shot off is going to allow, it's going to give you more options for where to shoot because you're going to have a goal center still trying to keep up with you. Um, similarly, crossing the Royal Road, and this is why quicker is always better too, is getting a quick shot off of a path, especially a path across the Royal Road, um, is also going to incre increase your chances dramatically for the same reason. That goaltender now has to reset, find the new shot angle. So here, a nice zone entry, and that player catches, releases back to the spot. Harvard here with a quick uh, backhand off of that path. Path across the Royal Road, quick uh, shot on our forehand. Same thing here against RIT. Pass, quick shot. You see that goalie now commits to sliding, and it opens up a lot of space. Here you're going to have a tip, so the player doesn't have time to collect it. She just has a stick out there, makes contact, and it's a good uh, good quick mid lane drive, seam to the middle, and a tip redirect. So again, those quick shots off of those passes that cross, that goaltender now has to cover the greatest amount of space that they'll ever have to cover. Get set, be ready. Their balance can be totally off. They have to decide if they want to slide, hold their feet, and it creates a lot of chaos that you can take advantage of either with a goal or with now potentially creating a rebound off of a, a slurry situation. Um, and then this is where I think a lot of the game is going as well, um, is using the back of the net because uh, if you ask any goalie, uh, post play is really uncomfortable for them. As we get to the outsides of the ice, um, navigating how to get to their post, how to cover it, um, how to see the front of the ice while they're looking behind their net trying to track pucks is a real challenge. Um, there's a reason there's been so much development in post coverage and the RVH, the VH, and there's so much talk about, you know, amongst goalie nation, if you've ever had the privilege of listening to it. Um, all these acronyms and, and RVHs and things. Um, there's a reason it's because it's one of the more difficult plays to physically set yourself um, and your body up for. Um, so you'll see a lot of players here in these scenarios, they're either shooting from low angles um, quickly um, or using the back of the net for pass outs um, to, to find players in the slot while the defense is turned. So here, goal line jam off a of power play. Here, using the net and wrapping and jamming. Not particularly Will you play pretty. that first one? Will you start back yeah, at that first sorry. one again? That one was quick. Yeah, sorry about that. So here it's a, it's a power play, so it's a half, a half wall player kicks it to the goal line, and then she jams it from there. you see that, that goalie there. Sorry about that. That goalie had a tough time getting from high to low into her post there, and she ends up getting kind of tight and gives up a, a low, basically, five-hole goal. I'll play that one more time. So step, shoot, and keep it on the ice. Here again, similar play, goalie coming from low to high off her post now struggles with that kind of wraparound jam. So even here, that Cornell goal here that we just saw, that player gets a puck from behind the net. Our goalie's now trying to come across with her and cover that post. So she jams that puck. And again, that's kind of what I'm talking about where it's not a goal itself, but it leads to a, a really dangerous rebound in the slot. Well, one, two, three, four, five players have their heads turned trying to see the puck and it allows this player in the slot to just flip in there and, and finish a rebound. So a rebound here that comes and jams on the, five, on the strong side, on the, sorry, on the weak side, on her forehand, um, always dangerous as well. Anytime you have scramble situations and you can attack, same type of play there off a of pass out, it creates a dangerous rebound. Here as well, five defensemen, heads are turned, Quick shot that creates another scramble situation and a rebound. Here as well, and this is a lot of what you're starting to see in the IHL right now with power plays can sometimes set up from behind or be run from behind. I'll try to go back to that as well. Where you'll see this red player here start to attack. That goalie pulls off his post a little bit. He bumps it back to the short side, and it's a quick, again, one-touch shot because he knows he won't have too much time there. So attack dish back, and then quick one touch as that goalie pulls off that midline of his net. So the midline extends really behind the net as well. It's a key area for goalies to start to shift and look through the other side potentially, um, which can open up a lot of holes there. 
Um, I know we work with our goaltenders with teams from behind the net a lot that tend to operate from behind the net on uh, on holding that strong side post and being really patient with their positioning while still being able to see the puck. So, any questions on all that, Chris? I know that was a, was a lot there. No, I think it's a lot. I think one of those pieces is recognizing the patterns of when and where goals are scored and how they're scored. Uh, Zach Nowak asked, you know, that in a game, most shots are contested, uh, shooting around a stick, bodies. How do you foster the ability, uh, adaptability in a player's shot? Um, given that you gave kind of three big scenarios that there's patterns, but there's still a lot of adaptability. How do you, how do you teach your kids that? Adaptability in terms of like the types of shot that they're taking and things like that. Yep, in the different situations they'll face. Yeah, totally, absolutely. Um, you know, I think that's that's where we talk about. That's why you have to have a lot of tools in your arsenal. Like you have to be able to have when you know you have time and space. Say on a rush, you might have time to catch and release, like we saw on a lot of those you know midline passes. Um, at the same point, you also might not be able to have the time to take um, to settle a puck down. You might just be able to get your body weight in your stick, touch one touch and flex it. Anything tight and in around the net. Um, you've got to be able to utilize your bottom hand, get low on your stick, control it, and uh, and get power to the shot. So so we work on a lot of those different types of scenarios with players, um, but ultimately, too, I think it comes down to how many reps they're willing to take. One of the things we tell our players, too, is you have to think about the types of scenarios you find yourself in a lot. If you're consistently an F3 who's finding yourself in the slot um, and you're finding a lot of those pass outs are coming to your stick because you're the you know more defensive player and you tend to be tend to be playing high, you're not necessarily in corners doing the hard work um, where you're still doing work, but um, you know, that might be more of an opportunity to work on your quick catch and release from the spot or your quick one touches. Whereas if you're driving and intending to wield the zone and attack off a of half ball, you're more of a McDavid style, um, you know, where you're utilizing your feet and your speed, then you, you want to think about how you can get that shot off quickly after, um, you know, after creating some lanes around defenders. Um, I know a lot of teams too will work with, um, you know, how do you attack a defender and then pull and shoot through the stick and, and find those triangles to, to get shots through. Um, you know, I think that's a high level skill as well that you can, you can keep working at. So there's a lot of different ways to take it. I, I think one of the biggest things as a player you can do is be self-aware and, and try to recognize and analyze where are the situations I tend to find myself in the most. And then I need to get repetitions in those areas. If you're a power play player, um, you know, where you're tending to find yourself in a specific position, again, this might be a little more specific to higher levels in college, but if I'm finding myself in a position where I'm constantly, um, you know, a backdoor one-timer option or I'm coming down on the puck and need to just get a strong hand one-timer on there and not wind up, um, you know, that's an area where I need to make sure I have enough practice that I get in that situation in a game and I'm not, I'm not thinking about it. So my, my advice to that would be to always tell players is to think about the types of the scenarios you find yourself in, you know, and, and where you get the majority of your scoring chances and then you need to to hammer and harp in on those types of um, shots so that you have the, the required kind of tools in your arsenal to pull out. You talked about getting power behind a shot and Emily Moorsdorf asked, how can she help her players who are still struggling to lift the puck or shoot the puck without flutter have harder, more quality shots? What advice would you have for her? Totally. Yeah, I think that, again, shooting all comes from your legs first, um, especially with younger players. I think that's the, uh, the tough part. It's the starting with your weight transfer, snapping through, and then making sure that they're rolling wrists over and snapping it. A lot of times when flutter shots come through, I think it's a little bit of uh, an open blade, an open toe blade, and then a little bit more of a byproduct of pushing the puck. Um, so even as simple as if you're working in stations with younger players, um, grab a piece of wall, take a, find a dent in the wall or a little piece of uh, puck mark, and focus on their shot, focus on pushing off that back foot, um, you know, and getting power into it, torquing hard, ripping with their core, and then following through, rolling their wrists over. So both those thumbs are facing at the net at the end of their shot with their blade closed. Um, you know, and then that just comes with time as well to be able to continue to add strength to your body with, with your off-ice conditioning, with, you know, obviously your natural um, development and biological development. But I think you can continue to create um, a stronger shot with better mechanics. And then if you do have access to anything like weighted pucks, there are um, there are some of those little red weighted pucks that you can add into your repertoire as well um, to kind of give you um, a little bit of a, a more of a challenge to try to create some more resistance for that shot through. Um, so for some who you see that they tend to have some better mechanics and they might just need to be challenged a little bit more, I think that'd be a, a neat opportunity as well. Great. Thank you, Sarah. Totally. Um, so again, it's more low angle shots here that make uncomfortable goaltenders. 
Um, attacking from behind, behind the net is, is big. So here, another low angle shot, driving low to high, creates a rebound as that goalie comes off her post. Here, this is an ugly one. <laughs> But because that player attacks in, and I think that's a real key, like we were talking about before, we want to attack in anytime we're we're looking to score. We can't throw these shots of these these um these pucks on net from the perimeter. So this player here gets this puck, starts to attack in, even though she's at a low angle outside the dots. You can see her head is looking to that driver, and because of that, she's going to make this goalie really nervous about trying to get off her post in case there's a centering pass. And she actually takes a good look there and shoots to that short side. So I always tell our players when we're in goalie world. A lot of times when you're attacking low, you're trying to see if that goalie will pull off that strong side post. You're trying to use some of the deception that we'll see in some of the later clips um, to try to, again, play that cat and mouse game. See if I can get her worried about somebody driving to the net, which I need, which is the other piece of scoring. And then see if I can open up that short side there and take a risk, you know, put a shot on net there from a low angle if I'm attacking in, um, you know, and, and um, give myself a chance. Another low angle rebound there too, and a no qu not quitting on the rebound, which I think is really important. We see this player again driving in. She gets inside the dots, gets a shot there to that short side. And a lot of times that short side rebound is going to stay right back to you on that short side as well. So she wasn't able to create a rebound to the inside, but got a rebound to herself. And then a quick one-touch shot on that rebound with very little net to, to finish. Um, but you have to have the... You have to have the stomach, I think, as a shooter to look to shoot from anywhere on the ice um, and attack in and make it a legitimate scoring threat. Um, I think that's the other piece of, of scoring is it, it, it sounds silly, but you can't, you can't score if you don't shoot. Um, so you have to be willing to on rush, on, on offense's own play, attack in and get shots to the net. Um, I think that's a, another step that a lot of players, especially freshmen, need to um, they end up taking in their first part of their career is that it takes them a while to realize that they have to attack the middle, um, you know, and, and get contact and get in there um, in order to get a puck there and get bodies there to score. So I think that's something for players, especially when you're talking about shooting drills. If you see like when you're doing push pull shooting that they're constantly just staying to the outside of the ice, you have to really challenge them to attack inside those dots, attack inside the scoring area for that shot and not just fade away and kind of throw a puck um, while, while trying to avoid contact. They've got to get in there and, and get that shot off. Um, and then, uh, you know, another piece that you can't avoid, and it's a, it's an old saying that people in pucks to net, and, and it's true, and this is why, um, but I think there's a real art form to setting, setting um, screens net front that goes underappreciated. Um, you'll see it a lot of times, like here, this is a power play clip where our net front player sets a really good screen that sets the goalie on her strong side post, and as that player attacks into the middle, um, towards the midline, it actually opens up that far side like we were showing on the angle change because the goalie takes too long to get across. Um, setting a screen is really important, and I notice a lot of times in youth practices, even sometimes in our practices, we talk about setting a screen and say a drill like a warm-up drill, um, or a couple phases into a warm-up drill, hopefully not right off the bat, but um, you'll see a lot of players just hanging out, and you see the goalie's eyes the entire time, so it's a small detail, but um, teaching players how to set screens and how to be effective as a net front, um, you know, as a net front disruptor is so, so critical. Um, you have to be able to not only be in the goalie's eyes and stay square and basically be a goalie yourself on the angle. You also want to think about your positioning, your readiness, as well as your depth. I mean, you want that goalie to be stuck in her crease. So like you'll see on this clip here, our player moves that puck high and you'll watch this net front player right here. She's right in the angle. She does a great job and it allows for this player to walk to the middle while that goalie's stuck looking on the outside and it's going to open up that entire far side for her shot. So now she attacks and can see that net like we were talking about. Same thing here. We get traffic to the net front. Quick shot. She doesn't have time, doesn't get it blocked. And because there's a flash screen coming through, it gets in her way. Same thing here. You'll watch the red team on this one. So this player starts to back up into the slot and it sets, a, it sets a pick. So now that player who's attacking in has her head up, right? That defense has her head up to see where the openings are now around that screen and then find the, find the shot where the goalie's not looking. <clears throat> Same thing here. This is a really good one for depth. So you see this Quinnipiac player has her heels on the top of the crease. There's essentially no area for our goaltender to get out. And this is a 5'10 uh, goaltender who had a lot of height and we're constantly trying to get her out and looking over screens. Because she's so tight to the crease there as a screener, she makes it really hard for a goalie to get out, see the puck, and utilize her size so you can have a goalie in effectively that way. Same thing here. So another power play, we've got a really good net front, net front presence here. Our goalie's got to look around her. And because of that, this quick shot comes in, and it doesn't lead to a goal immediately, but it creates enough chaos. She doesn't really see that shot that they're able to finish off the rebound. 
And again, you can see Union has three players at the net there, which is really important. <clears throat> to see another one here, and this is a great example of not all goals are pretty, but they, they all count. Um, as long as there's nothing, no reason to call it back. They see all the traffic here. Colgate's got a kid right in the crease. Again, hemming our goalie in deep. They've got a second presence right there. We're trying to get down, block a shot, and you'll see this puck kind of flutters over and into the back of the net. So it's not pretty, but as you can see, our goalie had no clue where that puck was because we had people in our eyes effectively, um, you know, who were, who were taking away our vision. And it's really hard to stop what you can't see. Again, it's another area of high-level goaltending that they really fixate on is how to see around screens, how to see the shot release and things like that. So if you're a net fun, if you're doing it with a purpose and you take pride in that really gritty area, um, you're going to give yourself and your team a, a really good chance to, um, to, to put a rebound or a goal in or potentially have something happen that – um, you know, the goalie can't, can't account for because they can't see it. And then it's kind of the last piece, and I've been kind of trying to build these up a little bit more in terms of, um, you know, skill that's required. And deception is kind of the highest level there because it, it really is the, the epitome of what we're saying that cat and mouse game is with goalies. So here you'll see a lot of players, if you can see their heads, I know it's not the biggest video, but if you can see their heads and their body languages, a lot of times they're coming in and they're looking as if they're going to make a pass or, or um, you know, or make a play with a puck. And then they're taking that shot really quickly. So they're forcing that goalie to have to think and read the play um, and use their IQ and sometimes catch some cheating. So right here, you'll watch this player on the rush here. He's got an odd man, uh, odd man rush, two on one, looks at the passer and then shoots the short side and is able to get his own rebound. So that goalie is, uh, is busy watching the play. Same thing here. You'll watch our, our player attacks in. She's got another two on one. She's looking to the middle. She gets a shot off, and that goalie is not quite ready enough for that shot because she's trying to read if that pass is coming through. Same thing here. You'll see number 10 waits that, waits that player out before she moves that puck to the back door. So quick slip pass. She waits, makes that defense and go down and commit to, to trying to, um, to block a shot. You can see this goalie steps on her edge. She thinks that's going to be a shot too. And then it's basically an open backdoor tap in. Um, which is which is pretty neat. So that's really the next level skill too. And to Tristan's point, when you can start playing some of those, um, you know, some applying more pressure and practice to these types of shooting drills, um, you know, then maybe that's something you can require of your players. So if I'm playing as a defenseman, as a coach in a drill, um, like a simple shooting drill, now I'm challenging my players to have to make me guess what they're doing. So maybe they're looking at the pass. And I put my stick there to try to take away pass, and they can learn to shoot it a little bit. Or maybe I can go pressure them. They can make it look like they're going to shoot, and then flip that pass across. Um, if you're doing, say, two on O, it's simple, simple that way. Um, so it's, it's really, it's a fun skill to work on. Um, and it's something you can, again, continue to utilize and, and emphasize anytime, especially you're doing small games as well. Um, how can you continue to challenge your players to, to be hard to play against, to, um, you know, to find ice and to, to really play, like we said, like a, a deceptive game against, um, you know, against defense. And a lot of that comes from your head, um, your head, your eyes, you know, what you're selling, what you're telling the defense you're going to do. And then some patience as well. There's a lot of poise that goes into hockey as much as it's a fast game. How can you manipulate that speed, slow it down in places to create room and, and pass in lanes for yourself? So we'll just finish. I won't go through all these because I, I put a lot in there. I think, Kristen, you can maybe post this um, presentation if people want more. But um, all these concepts that we talk about, you can, you can utilize them in small games. Um, and think about maybe what you guys want to focus on as a team. Um, you know, I know at the college level, a lot of times when we're doing um, pre-scouts, the teams we're going to play, we might, um, you know, we might set up some of the small games that we think will show us what a team's going to do offensively, um, you know, that weekend. And that's how, you know, kind of the game we're going to play that, that day. Um, so our goaltenders might be able to see a little bit of what they're going to see offensively from another team. Uh, but they're really good for reinforcing those concepts. I think at the end of the day, make it competitive too, and that's what small games do. But see if you can challenge your goalies and give them an opportunity to to score, um, to be engaged in the game, to win in some way. Um, I think that would be a really neat challenge we can keep building in for our goaltenders. Um, but any of the, any shot is a good shot in small games, which is why, like, if you want to emphasize scoring and continue to increase that uh, percentage for your team, it's a real key. Um, and it's a fun, it's a fun way to make mistakes. Like you might whiff on a puck, but you get a second chance on it. <laughs> I think that's, that's really key to emphasize too. It's a fun way to work on being hard to the net front, being tough to play against, um, you know, pushing your teammates in that drill, in that rep, and then coming back to line and being able to be okay, you know, and, and really compete at a high level. So that would be my suggestion is just use simple rules. Um, and that'll teach the concepts without you having to overcoach it. 
Um, I think that's really important. The structure that you put in place will allow you to reinforce what you want to talk about. And then you can coach for it a couple times here and there, but you don't have to stop the play a lot because they're naturally going to be put in positions where they can, where they can do that. Um, so one quick one that we like to use, and it's a lot of fun for players too, is bubble hockey. Um, I'm sure everyone's played this or called it something different at some point, but uh, essentially it's three on three, but this player can't cross the midline if we drew one between the dots, and then this X can't, can't cross the midline. O is shooting on this goalie, and X is shooting on this goalie. So coaches are putting pucks in every time one goes out of play. We usually let them play out like four or five pucks and then blow the whistle and switch the group of three, depending. Um, but this is really hard on goalies and it's very good for shooters because all these shooters have to be ready at all times. And it's a drill that emphasizes quick one touch passes and quick shots. Um, cause you've got goalies moving side to side, you know, midline passes being made. Um, and, it, and it's, it's really challenging. And I'm a big believer in, again, it's, it's an offensive minded drill, but defensively, it's a really great opportunity to showcase some, some guts, block shots and be really active with your stick defensively. So, um, everyone plays the Gretzky game. Yes. Yeah. Well, I was going to ask, you made a couple points on your slide about small area games, one of them being, you know, coaching your players. How do you go about speaking and talking to your athletes about shooting the puck, how to shoot it, where to shoot it? <laughs> yeah, so good. Um, one thing I know, and, and this is where USA Hockey Camps really kind of started that with me, was um, it's really tempting as a coach to want to just tell players everything. Um, and I know I've definitely fallen into that trap, but um, I think one of the best ways for them to learn is, is personally to help them think through it and think through really um, what, what they didn't, what they missed. Um, I found that too, like when a lot of players come back to the bench, it's, it's help, more helpful to say like, hey, what did you see? Or did you see this? Um, or what was happening there? Because a lot of times you might not even realize the situation or what they saw. Um, so in small games, I think it's, it's really helpful, like when they're coming back to the line, it's helpful to kind of ask them to walk you through the scenario. So say, I don't know, say they had a pass and they decided to take a shot. You know, I might say, hey, like, why did you choose to take that shot as opposed to make a pass to a wide open player? And she might say, well, you know, I thought the defenseman was cheating. I thought the goal, I thought I had short side in this. Um, so there's always a reason. And I think that's the biggest thing is to help them learn from their decisions that they either missed or didn't miss um, and then help them understand maybe what they're not seeing. Um, so that's been a, a really key piece for communicating. And then I think, too, like as a as a team, calling attention to the group, um, to the objectives in that game. I think one thing I always get really excited about too when you're watching a game is there's a million different things you can address and coach. And um, you want to stick to really the, the, the key pieces that you want to harp on in that game and then, um, you know, reinforce it. So maybe you're, yeah, maybe you're playing a game where it's like a three on one and it's supposed to be high level shots and scoring and you're seeing your players roll around the perimeter with a puck and not take a shot and not attack the scoring area and not get a screen there. Um, well, there's a reason you're playing that game. So that's, that's gotta be the reason you kind of rein them back in and remind them of that. But, but in terms of individually one-on-one, -on -one, which is fun as an assistant coach, um, if you're not running the drill to be able to chat with them when they get back to the bench, I think it's, it's always good to help talk them through those things and then, you know, hear their perspective as well you don't have all kinds of time in mind but um, you kind of pick your spots here and there with a couple players or maybe you re-emphasize it in a good way like hey I know we've been talking about getting your head up and amazing look you saw the you saw high glove and you took it you know and, you, and you're rewarded for it I think that's always the best way to teach too is to to highlight and uh, and reinforce when they do a great job with something that's great Tara so we're just over the hour so I know you've got some extra games in there um, that we can share with the group. I know Dave Caruso will talk about how people can access this, but thank you so much for your time today. That was fantastic. Um, lots of great pieces of knowledge in there on shooting and coaching players. So I'll shoot it over to Dave. Hey, thanks, Tara. Thanks, Chris, and great job. There's a lot of great stuff in there. You did a, did a great job. Just want to remind everybody that everything will be, um, or the webinar will be posted on the ADM Facebook page that you can review. Uh, at any time. And if you are interested in these uh, slides that Tara has, please email me at dave.caruso at usahockey.org. That's D-A-V-E dot C-A-R-U-S-O at usahockey.org and we'll give it to you. So uh, upcoming for our Zoom or webinars on tomorrow, we have Maria Mountain and Steve Thompson. And Maria is uh, huge in the goalie world or on off-ice training, but she's going to talk about at-home training strategies for your goalies, but also for your players. On Friday, we have um, Dr. Dean Krelars, who is um, one of the world-renowned leaders in physical literacy. He's going to talk about what is physical literacy and how it will enhance your athlete's performance. 
Um, and then for next week, uh, not posted yet, but we got some good ones. It's going to be Tuesday through Friday again at 3.30 p.m. Eastern. Um, so we're really excited by those, and we'll post those at a later date. So thanks again, Tara. Thanks, Kristen. Um, make sure you tune in tomorrow at 3.30 with Maria Mountain uh, on Facebook Live. And I uh, hope everybody has a, has a good day. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. Thanks. Good job, Tara.